do, Bob, uh, just a little bit more about the bad guys. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. All right, this is the tragma again. And the men that had the tragma of the beast, even in the pouring out of the, of the uh, first vial, they get this, the, bo the boils and, uh, and all the other ugly things that come upon them. But I want to remind you that there is a group of people who, gets, who get the victory over it, and they're still here. Now, I guess I'd better stop and talk about that for a minute. There are many Christians who are expecting to be zipped out of here before these ugly things happen. But we see people who get the victory over it, and they're standing on the sea of glass, and they're praising God because they were here when it happened. They didn't get the victory over it by getting zapped out of it. They got the victory over it by walking through it and becoming victorious over those things rather than having them, uh, having the ugly things uh, being victory over them. No, we really, uh, at this stage in our lives, have come out of the old rapture theory, and we believe that there are two groups of people on the earth, those that are destined to go to heaven and those that are destined to be alive and remain to the coming of the Christ, as far as Christians are concerned. Now, those that are going on to heaven probably won't really see in, in these scriptures all the things that we're seeing, but there's a group of people who have really seen scriptures like uh, the, the group that shall be alive and remain the coming Christ. And they said, well, how can I be in that group? How can I be in alive? How can I be, be remaining the coming of Christ? Now, when Christ comes, those people are not going to die and go to heaven. They're going to stay alive and welcome Christ at the coming of the Christ as opposed to uh, going up in, in, in some kind of a puff or smoke or, or, or rapture thing. No, they're going to be here. Now, for 2,000 years, the church has taught us, get ready to die. But there's a generation that doesn't need that message. That generation is going to overcome the last enemy, which is death. And that generation will begin to see scriptures and things that have to do with the fact that when, when, when Christ comes or when Jesus comes, it'll be to receive a kingdom, not to bring a kingdom. And he's going to receive it from the hands of those who took the kingdom, and that's the Christians, and overcoming and victoriously take the kingdom. So we have two concepts, and these concepts are what we call in conflict right now, and theologians are writing books, some uh, on the idea of rapturing and get out of the mess, and others on how to get through the mess victoriously. And right now in your Christian bookstore, uh, your, uh, I would have to say that that's the main emphasis of all the books, and the writers right now are in an argument about which uh, way God is going. Now, we have decided that both are correct, and here's the, the way we believe that. We believe that there, are a group, there is a group of Christians who will go off to heaven, but the only way to get to heaven is to die. I mean, that's the way people do it. They, they give their heart to Jesus, and then they, you know, live a good life and cross Jordan's chilly waters. They die, and they go off to heaven. But there's a group of people who will overcome, and they will not die. They will be here at the coming of Christ. They'll overcome the last enemy, which is death, and they'll bring heaven to earth. Instead of dying and going to heaven, they live and love and bring heaven to earth. Now, these people will be sealed with a seal of God and the that they had to do because God is going to take them the way they are and add to them. The devil, on the other hand, is going to take people and scratch and tear away from them. All right, Bob, we've got one more scripture, I think, and uh, or maybe two, but I'm going to skip right now because go to 20, verse 4. Would you mind? <clears throat> and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. All right, that's, that's good enough because I want to emphasize the forehead or the hand right now. And I want to say that these people did not receive it because there are some who teach that if you're alive at the time that these things pour out, you'll have to receive it. But the Bible says they didn't, and it's not necessary to receive it. You can overcome, and there is a group of people, a remnant, of course, but it's, it's small, and I admit that. But there's a group of people who will overcome uh, the last enemy and will overcome these things. Now, Bob... We're headed right now, finally, for the big scripture, the one I've been headed for all the time. This is the Exodus scripture because it summarizes what we're trying to say, and it summarizes the way God delivers uh, or, or, and deals with us. This is Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to do that again. Exodus chapter 20, and it's in verse 25. Exodus 20, 25. Go ahead and read, please. 
And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Now let's think about that for just a minute. Here's the problem. In Exodus 20, it's about the Ten Commandments. Go back and read some of those commandments back there, Bob, in, 10, in Exodus 20. Just pick up right on the side there. They're marked on the, on the margin there. Oh, here, let me flip that over for you, Bob. I, I, I pulled a, a, a trigger on you. Uh, Exodus 20 here. Honor thy father and thy mother and that kind of stuff. Do that, 12. Okay. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, what verse is that? That's uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. And now give me the next one. Uh, thou shalt not kill. All right, there's, a, there's another ten, uh, ten Commandments. What verse is that? Verse 13. All right, keep going. Thou shalt not commit adultery. All right, there's the next one. Go ahead. Thou shalt not steal. All right, that's the idea. Now, the context is the Ten Commandments. Now, keep going. Now, move your finger, Bob, past that and on up to verse 20 because I want to call your attention to... Uh, 25, sorry. 25. Call your attention to this context. It's just in the same context, and these are what we call Tassava commands. Now, we've got the ten day bar. Now, the Bible talks about the ten day bar. The word day bar is Hebrew, and it has the ten words. These are the ten commandments of Moses. But while we get to the, to the, to the 613 Tassava commands, this is one of the basic elementary commands. Now, read it, please, Bob. 25, verse 25, one of the elementary commands. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Now, here's what I want to tell you about that. The stone of the field is right now the way God wants it to be. And the Bible says we are the lively stones. We are the stones that make up his house. And the Bible says when you pick up that stone, if you put your tool upon the stone, you pollute the stone because God made the stone the way he wants the stone to be. Bob, pick up that verse over there in 1 Peter, would you please? It's over in uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 5, and read that, and then I'm, try to, I'm going to try to, to put this all together now in a wind-up because I, I've got to get the authority of this. Peter's speaking now about us. Go ahead, Bob, 2, 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I want to say. You are a stone. You are a lively stone. In fact, the Bible calls you a rockhead. <laughs> You're a stone. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't have said rockhead, <laughs> but uh, it is true. How many know that some Christians are rockheads? But we are stones built into his house. And even if we're rockheads, God said we cannot take our tool and chip away at that stone. Now, it is true. I can remember in the old days, they used to teach me that I was a stone and my wife was a stone and my children were stones and my mother and father were stones. My neighbor was a stone and the people that went to church with us, they were all stones. And God put us in this tumbler and we began to roll against each other and knock each other's corners off and smooth each other's out. And that's the reason that we were in church was to get our corners knocked off. But that's not what this says. This tells us that when we knock off each other's corners, we pollute the stone. So I'm going to try to get real serious right now and tell you to put away your tool. God did not call you to be a stone chipper. God called us to be masons. And the way masons do is to take the mortar and add the mortar to the stone. We're not to chip off the high parts of the stone, for when we do, we pollute it. No, we're to fill in the low parts with the mortar 
and the name of the mortar is love. And we pick that mortar up and we put that mortar on the stone, and then the stone can be assembled into God's house. For we we'll notice that one stone has a high part here, and the other stone has a high part here. And when they fit together, they fit together much stronger than if we were perfect billiard balls. If all Christians were a bunch of bowling balls or billiard balls, can you imagine trying to build a wall <laughs> with billiard balls? It would fall apart. The stones roll away from each other. And so I'm going to say it this way. God purposely formed us with high places and low places so that when we fit together, we might add strength to each other in this great building. Now that strength is then uh, mortared or put together more with this mortar of love, for God always acts by adding to us, not from taking from us. So if there is a tendency to deal with the Christian, the one you're thinking about, by taking out your, 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 uh, your tool and chipping away at that person and causing that person to become more perfect, in your opinion, by taking things out of their life. I'm going to tell you something right now. That's a wrong idea. That's marking the stone. That's scratching the stone. That's chiseling the stone. That's taking away from the stone of the field the way God created it. And God said, no, I don't want it that way. I want my stone of the field to be picked up the way it is, to be used the way it is, and added unto, not taken from, but added unto. And I certainly hope that that's making sense to a lot of our friends today. God wants to add to us. He adds to us by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost then comes upon our forehead. He changes our minds. He adds to us. He does not take from us. The devil, on the other hand, begins to chisel away, knocking away the corners, pushing at things out of our lives, and that's uh, not the way of God. However, concerning the word way, the way of God, Bob, this is the last scripture. Have you got it? It's over there in Psalms about the way of God, 103, verse 7. Would you read me that now, please? He made his ways, he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Now let's talk about that one for just a minute. The ways of God are known to Moses, but the acts of God are known to the children of Israel. Now I'm going to say that again. There's a difference between the ways of God and the acts of God. For the ways of God are patterns, paths. God's method of dealing with us has to do with the way of God. And Moses understood that and knew the pattern and the path that God would take. But the acts of God, that's entirely different. The acts of God are what the insurance co company calls, well, it's an act of God. And what's that? It's a taking away. It's a, it, it's a tornado. How am I doing? It's, 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 a, it's a storm. It's something that'll pick you up and smash you down. It's something that'll scratch on you. It's something that will that, that, chisel. And it's called an act. We want to be like the prophets of God. And our goal is to follow in his ways and not respond to his acts. Now, I'm going to try it another way. Except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But assuming that it goes into that ground and dies, it's dark, it's cold, it's wet, but something begins to happen to it and it turns into 30, 60, and 100 fold. Oh yes, one other thing. While it's down there, a worm goes by. And I think you're seeing something. Sometimes our lives get wormy, don't they? Sometimes our lives are dark and they're cold and there are acts that are happening against us and these are acts of God. And Israel responds to his acts. But Moses responds to his ways. The prophets of God know the ways of God, and they know 
that even though the acts of God are working at that time to take things away from them, to constrict them, to hurt them, there's something more. And this thing that's more is this. There is a purpose for constriction. There is a reason for the acts of God. And the purpose of those acts of God is to cause 30, 60, and 100 to fold to come forth. But if we're only responding to God during the times of the acts, then we're the type of Christian who prays in the hospital, and that's about it. I hope you caught that. The Christian who prays in the hospital or the Christian who prays when the house is on fire, don't you see? That's the Christian who is the, the, the Israelite, the people that know him by his acts. But there are other Christians who recognize him by his ways and realize that the purpose of the act of God is to multiply us, to get us to be bigger and more uh, forceful or 3600. And that's where we are today. That's what we're dealing with in our decisions about God today. So my dear friends, my message to you today is this. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Find out who is writing on you. Ask God to write on you with his seal. And tell the devil, get behind me, Satan. I'll have no more of your scratching, no more of your chiseling, no more uh, of, of taking away from me. Get out of here. Leave me alone. I'm on the Lord's side. However, when constriction comes your way, then be sensitive to realize that you're now in a new test and you get to decide. And here's your new decision. Now at this stage, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to respond to God as Moses did by his ways or as Israel did by his acts. If you respond to God through the acts of God, you'll never amount to much. Oh yes, you can get to heaven, of course, but you can't rule and reign, you can't multiply, and the good things of God won't be yours. But I want to say this, one more thought. If you decide to, even in the times of constriction, to respond to God by his ways, then you know that even though the corn of wheat has fallen into the ground and died, it has a tremendous potential of coming forth in great multiplication, 30, 60, or 100, and whatever. So the ways of God are a lot better, but the acts of God still work against us. And so now this is what I want to say to you. Choose you this day who you serve. And when it comes to you, when it's one way or the other, when you get a choice, always choose the ceiling. But sometimes you have no choice. So choose the way. And the way of God will always come back to multiplication when you can get the ceiling again. And then the charagma or, or, or the gouging or the, or the scratching will have nothing to do with you anymore. Choose that which is best. And choose the way of, of multiplication, of the choose the kingdom of heaven. Choose the kingdom of Oranos. The word Oranos means expansion. Choose to expand. Don't choose to contract. But if God brings contraction into your life, then turn your back on responding to the acts and turn your face toward responding like Moses did and his ways. See him with his ways, not his acts. I hope this is making sense to our friends today because to me it makes great sense. It tells me how to decide. And when I don't get my own way, then at least how to respond. So <laughs> to decide right or to respond right, that's the whole thing. That's the answer to our question. All right, let's pray together now that this, uh, this will make sense to our friends. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that the Holy Spirit will actually write upon the foreheads and the hands, stamping an image, <coughs> a, uh, a, a seal, upon the foreheads or the hands of all of our friends. 
and that the friends who believe right now, after they believe, will be sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And the Holy Spirit will come upon them and change their lives. And that as they decide, they will always decide to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save these souls, change these minds, and make us into what we ought to be. Change us from what we are to what we ought to be. Lord, we reject the marking. We reject the, the cheragma. We reject the chiseling and the, the, the scratching of the old devil. And we say we want the kingdom of Arenos. We want the kingdom of heaven. We want the kingdom of expansion to work in our lives. But we also realize, Lord, there are times when tribulation will come. And tribulation will come around us like a storm. It'll be a tribulating circumstance that will work against us. And it'll be an act. It'll be an act of God. And so cause us to respond to that correctly, the way Moses does, and find his way, his path, through this thing, not just stopping with the act of God, the ugly thing that has come, the, the, the storm or the situation or the fire, who knows what. Lord, we pray that every one of our friends will be responsive to the ways of God. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been good to be with you, and we look forward to another time.